Can you hear me in the cheap seats? <laughs> if you can hear me in the cheap seats, raise your hand. Super, good. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming this evening. My name is Earl King. I serve as the pastor at St. Martin's Episcopal Church here on Grand Island. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you, welcoming you this evening. There are lots of other things you could be doing tonight. You've chosen to be here for some reasons connected to domestic violence. I don't need to be giving you all the statistics tonight. Others who know more than I will be giving you statistics. But as a pastor, I hear regularly the stories of those people who are in situations of domestic violence. Every time I preach, I know that I'm looking out on people who either are suffering or who have suffered, excuse me, from uh, domestic violence incidents at the hands of others. They've done nothing to deserve this abuse. So, in the name of all those victims, I welcome you this evening, and I invite your prayers. Let's pray. Gracious God, you created us in your image and breathed life into us, a life you want us to live abundantly. You ask us to free those living with abuse, physically, mentally, or spiritually, from their oppression, so that they may walk in peace and enjoy a life full of your blessings. We ask you to surround them with your care and protect them by your loving might and permit them to enjoy health and healing, wholeness and strength, calmness and peace and love. Open our ears, our eyes, our hearts to be more aware, outreaching and supportive to people in abusive situations so that they won't feel alone and will know that someone cares. Let us love them as you have loved us. In the name of the Lord we pray, amen. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you my friend Mary Travers Murphy. Many of you will remember her from her time as a TV newscaster. She now serves as Executive Director of the Family Justice Center of Erie County. So please join me in welcoming her. last decade here in Erie and Niagara counties, we've had dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of women murdered by their significant other. It keeps on going. It keeps on happening. In the last decade, two of those murders touched me personally in my fourth and final year in my term as Orchard Park Town Supervisor. The night the airplane went down in Clarence, our police chief called our home and I thought, uh-oh, somebody from Orchard Park was on that plane. He was calling to tell me that we had a murder in Orchard Park and I remember saying, Andy, this is Orchard Park. We don't have murders in Orchard Park, never in the history. What the heck happened? Proceeded to tell me the body of Asia Hassan was found brutally murdered in the cable television company office where Asia worked with her husband. Uh, Asia was my friend. Prior to running for office, I was in the media for 25 years. Prior to launching the cable television enterprise, Asia and her husband, who was a vice president at M&T Bank, purchased the 7-Eleven in the heart of the village to raise money to launch Asia's dream. She owned it and she operated it. Asia was behind that counter morning, noon, nights, overnights, weekends, gave birth to two babies during ownership, both cases, two days after giving birth, those little babies would be propped up right behind her in their car seats. They were there every time Asia was on duty, which was constantly. I'd run in to get my coffee before running into Eyewitness News stand in line and try to get my hands on those babies. They were gorgeous. One looked like our youngest son, Jack. She would pick my brain about broadcast journalism. She was the investigative consumer reporter for 25 years. She would sometimes hand me tapes of prospective anchors drafting the operations plan for that dream of hers, running the show, caring for those two infants, two preteens, Michael and Sonia, from her husband's previous marriage. Asia adopted those kids loved them and treated them like her own. She was involved in school events, sports, all their friends and families, activities. I can tell you, community horrified, devastated by what happened to this beautiful young Orchard Park and mom. Six months, almost to the day, Chief rang my cell phone. Hello, Chief, what's up? Well, I went on the murder in Orchard Park. Now what? Tells me the body of Angela Moss was found earlier that morning by her coworkers leaving the night shift where Angie worked as a nurse. Chief speculates that Angie was executed. 
bullet through her forehead, left to die on the side of the road, in the dark, over the course of hours, in the shadow of Ralph Wilson Stadium. Immediately upon discovery of her body, her grief-stricken, and I will tell you, guilt-ridden co-workers gave us a name and a motive. They knew 28 days prior to that that Angie's fiancé had coerced her into signing over her life insurance policy, naming him the beneficiary. We had a name, we had a motive. We had Detective John Payne, Orchard Park PD, on it. He said, Mary, I'll tell you, that was the worst, worst crime scene I ever had to deal with. I don't know if I can, I said, John, you walked into Asia's crime scene 18 minutes after she was decapitated, not knowing how she died. He said, yeah, well, this was worse. At least we were gonna have a quick arrest. Name, motive, days go by, no John. Weeks go by, anything, John. Months go by, three years and one month go by. I'm driving to work and I hear on WBFO, Orchard Park cold case murder appears to be solved with the death of Angela Moss with the arrest of Ronald Epps, charged in an eight-count indictment with insurance fraud. U.S. Attorney, prosecutor, I'm thinking, well, clearly I didn't hear that one right. Where the hell is the district attorney on this one? Call up the U.S. Attorney. Bill, tell me I got this wrong. You can put a bullet through somebody's forehead and leave them to die on the side of the road and get away with it, but you can't get away with ripping off State Farm Insurance. What gives? And where is the district attorney on this? He said, okay, calm down. For whatever reason, the district attorney, Frank Sedita, repeatedly slammed the door in the face of John Payne. He finally gave up, knocked on my door, and said, is there a federal circuitous route? Maybe we can get this guy. And I took a look. He said, here's what you need to know. In order to prove that he ripped off State Farm Insurance, we have to prove without a doubt he murdered Angie. We think this case is airtight, so stay with us. <coughs> it's going to have a good outcome. But, Mary, I'm telling you, it could be a year or two or three before it goes to trial. Another three years later, we're talking six years, one month after the death of Angie, Mr. Epps was let out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Eventually, sentencing was rescheduled four times. Convicted, and sentence was 45 years, 65 years. What was it, Tim? 65 years behind bars. Mr. Epps is 49 years old. He will never see the light of day again. I genuflect daily at the altar of Detective John Payne for being so dogged about securing justice for Angie's devastated parents. Her do father died during the trial, and her sister committed suicide. And the U.S. Attorney for taking the case. Those two cases, Angie and Asia, they haunt me every day. They touch me deeply. They're the reason we jump out of bed every day to do this work. Last year, just in Erie County, it's the annual number of domestic violence police calls. Just in Erie County, we throw the Niagara County stats out because we can't count that high. 14,300 domestic violence police calls in Erie County annually. Centers for Disease Control says we can take this stat to the bank. We know that only one out of every seven cases is reported. 14,300 called in, that represents one out of every seven times it's happening. We know this is happening in every one of our communities. We know one in three girls in that early teen to early 20 age will be touched by an abusive relationship. One out of four women, one out of nine men and boys, that number, that stat, is going to be changed to one in seven, if it already has and it will happen any day now. Touched by an abusive relationship. I heard those stats going back eight years ago, eight and a half years ago, I was still in office and thought, really? Who knew? I have seven brothers and sisters. I'm one of four sisters. My husband's one of nine kids, five sisters. Sisters up the yin yang. He had to be thoroughly trained for six months before I could go speak publicly about it because we can't mess up when we're out there talking about it. It doesn't matter if we're speaking at high noon in the swankiest country club in East Amherst or Clarence, in the most impoverished community center in the middle of the east or west side of Buffalo or East Aurora. That one in three, that one in four, that one in seven number plays out every time we speak, everywhere we go. These abusive relationships do not stop at any zip code or municipal line. They don't stop at any level of education or affluence, at any age or race or religion or culture. We see them in virtually every segment of society. I was having lunch shortly after I took the job in January of 2010 with a prominent physician. I interviewed her all the time when I was a reporter. She was a spokesperson locally for the Medical Society. And then nationally, in addition to running a thriving practice of her own, she's an internist. And she said, I love this Family Justice Center. 
so want to volunteer, but I've just been appointed to a policy position in the Obama administration. I'll be commuting to D.C. I don't know what my availability will be to help. But keep up the good work. I'm a survivor. I got out in 2003 when my husband put a loaded gun to my face. He dropped my fork right out of my hand and knocked my water glass over trying to get my fork, and I realized one in three, one in four from every segment of our society. We boil the definition down to one word so you can file it up here and use it as a yardstick. Am I, am I not? We know that victims of these abusive relationships rarely identify themselves as a victim of abuse. We'll get to that in a second. Is she, is she not? My gut is telling me something's up. Trust your gut, something's up. What about him? Really, can men be victims? Mm -hmm. We know the number, one in seven. The word is control. One person trying to control every aspect of another person's life. They do that through violence, tool in the toolbox. They do that through the threat of violence, constantly dangling that threat over the head of their victim in order to control them. Abusers are lazy. They would rather scare the living daylights out of somebody than actually beat the living daylights out of somebody. And they do it through an array of highly effective, emotional, psychological, financial, sexual abuse, leaving their victims without any sense of who they are. We know a few things about trauma associated with these relationships. Experts have been telling us for years, victims and children growing up in homes where this is happening, suffering from trauma, in many cases, post-traumatic stress disorder. The brain researchers and the neuroscientists used to think the younger the children were in the household, the more protected they were from the effects of the trauma. The brain research, neuroscience coming out now from across the globe is saying, nope, we now know that babies hours old lying in the bassinet, babies still in utero, and everybody else in the household suffering from a rewiring of the wires in the brain, setting them up for a lifetime of mental health conditions they weren't born wired to get, in particular lifelong depression and physical ailments, diabetes, autoimmune disease, cancer, heart disease, trauma literally leaving a mark on our DNA. We know it takes, on average, seven to eight attempts to permanently leave an abusive relationship. You're trying to help somebody, and you're not dealing with the skilled, experienced, talented, passionate advocate guaranteed to drive you to drink and right out of your mind. Just go. He kicked you in the belly, and you're four months pregnant. Leave. Very complicated, on average. As I mentioned, seven to eight attempts to permanently leave an abusive relationship. Trauma undermining a person's ability to think clearly, to make logical decisions, to even articulate accurately what's going on. Seven to eight attempts to permanently leave an abusive relationship. We know a few things about abusers. If there is a shining light when it comes to this horror show in our society, as phenomenally gifted as they are when it comes to this control and power, they're all playing out of the same handbook. So if we can get out there, and spell out the big red flags, the warning signs right out of the handbook, we have a really good chance at stopping this. I was at Williamsville East High School this morning with hundreds of kids, and the message was clear. The body language is downright horrifying. We've been called now into the middle schools during the last few years, passionate pleas from the social workers and the administrators, get in here, these kids need to understand what a healthy relationship is. In the last two years, we've been getting those panic calls from the grammar schools. We can get out there, teach what a healthy relationship is, they're mimicking what they see at home. Seven to eight attempts to permanently leave an abusive relationship. This is complicated business. Going back about 15 years ago, a group of 100 people in this county, in Erie County, got together to try to figure out, how are we going to do this better? Every year, the number of homicides go up. Every year, the number of police calls go up. Every year, kids younger and younger engage in these abusive relationships. We're not getting it. You need to do a better job. What is the problem? People are returning. We know every day. In some cases, it's safer in that moment in time to return to an abusive relationship with a safety plan crafted and drafted by an experienced, skilled, talented, passionate domestic violence advocate. We see that. Yeah, I'm going back. He reads my mind. I swear he does. He told me if I even thought about leaving, he would hunt me down to the ends of the earth and he would kill me. So by God, 
I'm going back until I can get a plan in place where I can get my kids out and these babies out and we can live to talk about it. Children being used as pawns in these cases, we hear that every 30 seconds. Those babies are your life. You leave, I will take them out. Or I will hire the best attorney in town. I control all the finances in this relationship. You haven't worked in 16 years. Well, wouldn't let her. Never got that GED, let alone the college degree. Well, you wouldn't let her. I'll get witness after witness after witness on that witness stand to declare you a crazy, whack job of a mother. The judge will award me full custody, at which point I will cut off all access. You will never see your precious babies again. By the time I get done with you, you will be homeless, living in a cardboard box, life as you know it, over. Again, I've had rabbis and priests and reverends say to me, oh my goodness, we were never trained in this. In the interest in sincerely trying to help, I recommended marriage counseling. I can tell you, many therapists out there not educated or trained in the nuances and complexities of domestic violence. Person goes in, a victim goes into that counseling se session thinking it's a safe place. Anything she says in the context of that session will be used against her the minute she walks out the door. That can be deadly advice. I have a group of 25 women's, women that I've gathered in the last eight years since I've been doing this work, ranging in age now from very early 20s to 80s, and every manner of age in between. They inform the decisions we make. They tell us what to say when we're out there presenting. They tell me when they were in the midst of what would be defined as classic domestic violence, they never would have identified themselves as such. Really? So when you heard the term domestic violence, what did you think? Oh my God, that horrible thing that happens and that horrible thing in our society. Ah, just too painful to even talk about. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a, okay. Um, so when you were in it and you heard that term and you thought, okay, that horrible thing in our society, who, who, who did you think were victims? Oh. We had a big party, big gathering at my house one night. We were talking about this, and I remember the aha moment. Well, it, it, it's women who <coughs> poor self-esteem, maybe women a little codependent, women living in trailer parks in the South, women living in big <coughs> urban ghettos in big cities. Uh-uh, not us. Okay? So when you were in it, how did you describe the relationship? What verbiage did you use? That was the aha moment. It was difficult. It was a roller coaster. Eventually, no highs, and that low, the lows were terrifying and terrorizing 24 7. It was rocky. I just walked around thinking if I did this and not that, and that and not this, none of this would have happened. Or he had anger issues. Not understanding that anger is a very effective tool in the toolbox of the abuser, they can turn it on, turn it off, just like that. It wasn't until they sat with a trusted friend or an advocate and went through the checklist. Is your every move controlled? Have you been isolated from all your family and friends? Are you humiliated behind closed doors for hours on end? Eventually, was that humiliation taken public? Are you constantly being accused of cheating and fooling around behind his back? Right? My 25 women who got out tell me they were so worn down emotionally and physically that by the time the first punch or hit or shove down a staircase occurred, they couldn't even pinpoint that moment in time. The best tool, teaching tool, that came out was about two years ago. It was that video that went viral of the NFL player dragging out of the elevator through the lobby at 3 o'clock in the morning his unconscious fiance. By the time that went viral, several weeks had passed. Somebody was trying to cover it up. It hit social media and went crazy. We were out speaking that day, and eight hands immediately, simultaneously went up, and I thought, oh shoot, we're not going to be able to leave questions until the end. We have to deal with it right now. And these were the questions. Mary, 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 she went back. Why'd she go back? Why did she go back, Mary? She married him. As soon as she got out of the hospital, she married him. Why did she marry him? Mary, it's all about the money, right? She was all about the money. And I thought, ooh, okay, good teaching moment. Okay. I think for starters, we ought to rephrase the question. Why did he cold cock her in the elevator? Why does he abuse? We are never, ever, ever, ever going to pin the blame for the abuse on the victim. We're going to hold that abuser accountable and send a clear message to people suffering behind closed doors. It's not your fault. 
you do not deserve this, and you sure as heck are not responsible for it. But the most effective tool in the toolbox is to understand that nobody falls in love with an abuser. Victims to be, and this is right out of the playbook, fall in love with a loving, charming, funny, engaging, popular, talented angel. These relationships tend to go from zero to a thousand miles an hour like that. Victim to be, being told, I love you, you're my soulmate. I feel like God put you here for me. Nobody gets me the way you quite get me. Honestly, the thought of you being anybody else makes me downright suicidal. We need to be exclusive. Love you. You're brilliant and you're beautiful. Falling in love with an angel who slowly but surely goes back to the handbook and starts controlling and isolating and humiliating and accusing them of cheating. Abusers love to have this huge set of rules that apply only to the victim, not to them. But the most effective tool in the toolbox is for that monster who controls and humiliates to morph right back into that loving, charming, funny, engaging, talented angel. It's a traumatized person, seven attempts on average, leaving and going back to figure out angel fake, monster real person. And you are never, ever, 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 ever going to make that monster an angel. That's the fake. And so that is the aha moment for victims, especially when they're dealing with a domestic violence advocate. I told you 15 years ago, a group of 100 people called to that table to try to figure out how we're going to do it better. They had philosophical differences right on down to men should not be at the table. They're the problem, right? People push back. You know what? These are our sisters and our daughters and our nieces and our coworkers and our neighbors and our employees and our congregation members. They kept at it and they decided to follow somebody trying to get out. First stop, often family court to get that ex parte temporary emergency order protection. That particular exercise can take four and a half to five hours. With a victim standing there with two little kids in tow, traumatized, scared to death, only to be told, oh, sweetie, honey, that's sorry. You just have to tell the attorney referee doesn't rise to the legal level. She can grant that for you. You need to go home and pull yourself together and get your story straight. Come back in a day or a week or a month. So she's thinking, legal level? I tried to ask that man over there behind the window what to expect. He didn't even look up. I tried to ask that woman over there on the desk. She looked like she was in charge. She was mean. I go home. My husband had me in the corner last night with his hands on my throat. I'm dead. I need Haven House. That shelter where people can go, the alternative is to lose it. Oh, I interned there in college. I read in the paper they had a beautiful new campus. I don't know. It's in an undisclosed world. Okay, scratch that. Maybe what I need to do is get these two little ones over to the Child Advocacy Center. They witnessed that attack last night. It's not the first time. They've been melting down all day. Now they're over on Franklin. I don't know if I need a referral. Oh, shoot, it's 10 to 5. It's Okay, scratch that. Maybe what I need to do is get myself over to my own advocate. Last night was the final straw. I need out. Now she's over on Main Street by UB South Campus. Traffic is going to be a mess. It's no what the group of 100 people found, despite the marvelous services scattered all over Erie County, that was the problem, forcing a person to go there. And then back, well, honey, you got to file charges, but you have to do it over there, but you need that DIR paperwork over there, and that's got to be notarized. It was easier to throw in the towel and return to the abuse than to navigate all the agencies that could help. The team decided, all right, let's take everything, put it in one place. A 1.3 VAWA, Violence Against Women Act grant later, the Family Justice Center opened on the 14th floor of the main Seneca building 11 years ago, like this week. All these partners lined up, ready to help, down a hallway. You need that order of protection, we got you covered. We partnered with 8th Judicial District Family Court through the miracle of what started out as video conferencing 11 years ago and one and a half years ago turned into Skyping. We can so secure those temporary emergency ex parte orders of protection right from the sanctuary of our gorgeous Family Justice Center. We have a forensic medical unit, the only one of its kind in New York State, dedicated to domestic violence. Do we have the video here tonight that we're going to play or no? Okay, so I can go a little couple minutes longer. We have a really good video. It's on our website. So when you go home tonight, Google up Family Justice Center of Erie County. Scroll down. You'll see Voices Ending Violence videos and hit the little picture of a black and white, beautiful young woman in a hat. And you can see exactly what we're describing. The only forensic medical unit dedicated to domestic violence in all of New York State. We have four domestic violence advocates who are trained and passionate and skilled and experienced. We have Buffalo Police, 
with a um, on-duty officer and a report technician right there. Neighborhood Legal Services is there, divorce, custody support. We have partnered very closely with Judith Olin. She's sitting back there. She took over the law school, and there's a clinic that Sue Tompkins, who was sitting right there, former Family Justice Center board member, founded and developed. They can help us uh, draft orders of protection for our clients, and we can actually give them cases. Sometimes there's a little gap between someone might make a little too much money for neighborhood legal services, certainly can't afford an attorney. Those cases go to Judith, who is a former assistant district attorney, an assistant state attorney general, ran the Child Advocacy Center, and now teaching at the law school and running their clinic. Anything and everything you need in one place. I was looking at this model back when I was still in office, still traumatized by those two deaths, thinking, damn, if I could have achieved consolidation like this in one place, I would have stuck around for another couple of terms. It truly is a miracle. On the second anniversary of Asia's death, we clipped the ribbon on the very first Family Justice Center satellite in a beautiful home owned by Orchard Park Presbyterian Church. We, in a blizzard, had 500 people show up to dedicate the day and the satellite to Angie and Asia. It was a group of Park Parsons, all these different congregation leaders that came together. This organization had been together forever. Anytime a new congregation pastor comes in, they're automatically a member of the Park Parsons. They came to the Family Justice Center the day I decided to take the job and said, we need help. We, we celebrated a memorial mass for Asia the other day. Hundreds of people turned out. We debriefed each other at the end. These people are coming to us now. People we never expected in our congregation saying, I'm a victim, and I don't want what happened to Asia and Angie to happen to me. Help. So the Park Parsons got together and said, what are we going to do? Dick Young, pastor of the Presbyterian Church, said, I, I got this house. My maintenance man who's... Uh, but on the job 40 years is retiring. Uh, you can have the house, but I'm gonna, I think you should just build a shelter there. The executive director at the time that day said, no, Haven House is in the shelter business. Mary just took the job, so figure it out. I know from working downtown at that point for 30 years, suburbanites, north and south of the city, don't like coming up to Buffalo. <laughs> you ever heard that? I lived in Lockport for six years. Well, technically, you'd be going down to Buffalo, right? You're north, whatever. I go to the Sabre game, I get taught in that hit, caught in that crazy biblical wind tunnel, it screws up my hair for three weeks. That's true, I will grant you that. But we thought, what we could do, at which point Pastor Young said, all right, caveat here, the house needs $100,000 worth of work, but we'll help you raise it, you know, and uh, we'll help you sustain it. And so I went back to my board, my first board meeting, Sue, you may have even been there, I said, so... Um, I'm go we're we're going to partner with uh, some Orchard Park folks. We're going to raise $100,000 in this year, and we're going to open up this satellite. And the board said, no, we don't have a penny to dedicate to this project. I'm sorry, zero. So you know how hard it is to even raise $1,000? I just ran a campaign, run a campaign, and raised $50,000 like that. I thought, yeah, it can't be that hard. So they gave me a few years to do it, and they said, you know, if you're getting some momentum, we'll push out that deadline for you. Seven months later, ready to open. We raised $113,000 like that. We recruited 111 people like that. And on the second anniversary of Asia's death, 500, 000, 500 people came out to celebrate the day. We had great coverage from the press. We had a be beautiful picture in the Buffalo News. That night at like 20 to 12, my husband was on a um, Bill's trip, I, my cell phone rings. And it's this woman, she said, you know, I just uh, just saw this coverage you had at six. I saw more coverage at 11. I'm calling from Williamsville. Sorry to call, it's so late. A friend of a friend said you wouldn't care. What are we, chop liver? You don't think we need one of these here in Williamsville? I, I said, okay, get out here. I said, give me two years. I need to make sure we can financially sustain this. I need to make sure volunteers will come and help and be reliable. And I need to understand if the clientele will, will come will knock on our door and trust us. Two years later, after major success in Orchard Park, found myself in Williamsville at Calvary Church, about 100 people in the room. We didn't have an Angie and we didn't have an Asia, but David Wisniewski's sister, Jackie, had just been gunned down in the stairwell of ECMC by her surgeon boyfriend, who then killed himself. I brought David with me. 
And I knew walking out that night, this was gonna happen quickly. It happened so quickly that we actually clipped the ribbon, clipped the ribbon and celebrated and didn't open to the public for another four months. We had a team of 100 people who signed up. They raised $130,000 like this and said, Mary, can we deviate from the Orchard Park model? I said, no, that was just the model, whatever you want to do, why? Well, we want to put that money in the kitty to hire another advocate. We're going to be busy. Territorial-wise, geographically, we're bigger. Okay, how do you propose remodeling the house that North Presbyterian Church said they'd give us? It's kind of a dump. They said, we're going to adopt out 13 rooms, all 13 rooms. What do you mean? Well, we'll find friends, an organization, a church who will adopt the room and then be responsible for everything financially in it. All right, I think that's a good idea. In one week, they adopted, all, adopted out all 13 rooms, including the half bath lavatory downstairs. <laughs> in St. Mary's of Swarmville, they actually smuggled in a high flush toilet from Canada. They wanted the best for our clients. <laughs> Father Yetter came to bless it. I said, Father, we lovingly refer to this as the holy crapper. <laughs> and he got right into his prayer. And we finally opened, and we have been very, very busy in Williamsville. We now go, we started out half days, now we're full days during the week, two days in Orchard Park and two days in Williamsville. And several months ago, a team of people in Grand Island, including the Grand Island supervisor, came down to the Family Justice Center for a tour and said, you know what? We think we'd like a Family Justice Center satellite here in Grand Island. And we said, okay, what do you think we should do? We should gather together a team of people get a little sign up list, see who wants to be part of that founding mother, founding father team for the satellite, gotta find some free space. Here's the beauty of the two satellite offices, these beautiful church owned homes. The bedrooms are gorgeous client living rooms. Haven House is in the business of shelter, not us. A dollar a year. A dollar a year. So they sustain themselves and they cost us very little and we work with volunteers. So it's a beautiful model. Tonight is the culmination of those few meetings we had. And Beverly Kenny's here too from the Grand Island Town Board. They pledged support. They're gonna to talk to you for about a minute in a little while. But I just wanted to lay the groundwork. There'll be a sign up sheet. Karen Panzarella is here. Karen is on the Family Justice Center Public Awareness Committee. Karen is a PhD. She teaches the doctoral physical therapy students at Duval. And I've been speaking to her classes every semester for seven or eight years. And we've become dear friends. And Karen, at a public awareness meeting several months ago, said, you know what, I'm a survivor. And I thought it would be great tonight if we could have, Sharon, have Karen share her story. So Dr. Karen Panzarella. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, you got it. And I'm not talking about physical therapy, so this is not easy. Um, 20 years have gone by, but it just doesn't end when the relationship ends, particularly if you have children together. <clears throat> Almost 20 years have gone by, and the abuse continues through, through the court system. But it doesn't start out that way. Instead, it all starts out like a fairy tale. I was swept off my feet. I had finally met my Prince Charming. I, along with my friends and family, were so, so sure he was Prince Charming because he showered me with gifts, he took me to places I had never been before, and he was a well-respected physician in my community. He was interested in my career as a physical therapist and thought it was nice that I was well-educated and self-sufficient. He ordered my food for me because I had no experience at such fine restaurants. He planned all my free time with me with wonderful activities and events to assure that I really knew that he was my prince. He planned a trip for New Year's Eve to a ski resort just nine months after we met. The weekend was well orchestrated. Just after midnight, he proposed to me in front of all our friends, gave me an amazing, amazing engagement ring. I was stunned. We hadn't even talked about marriage. I couldn't respond. I began to shake. He assured me in front of everyone that he already consulted my parents and my friends. They all want me to say yes. So I did. The wedding, just six months later, was planned by him and his family. My only job was to get a dress and provide a short list of invites. Our wedding day was a fairy tale on the Long Island Sound. 
I was sure I had both of my glass slippers on. We leave for our two week honeymoon and everything changes. I had never been to the Caribbean islands before so I wanted to buy some souvenirs for my family. I was told that I was not to buy anything for my family any longer and that now our funds were just for us, we had to concentrate on our future. Any discussion was met with objection and disdain. When we returned to Buffalo, I was told to direct deposit my paycheck into our joint account. He would handle all the finances. He gave me a credit card that could be used at my discretion until every transaction was scrutinized. The control was enforced so consistently that I didn't even realize I was surrendering to try to keep some sanity in my life. When I didn't become pregnant on our honeymoon, I was made to feel inadequate until I did on our first anniversary. Conceived on the Greek island of Rhodes, I was hoping my fairy tale would return. The birth of our daughter was one of the happiest events in our marriage, but quickly overshadowed by the lack of partnership in our relationship. As an overwhelmed new mother, I was expected to manage my full-time job, our daughter, all the household, all without the ability to make any decisions without my husband's full approval. I was realizing then that my prince was selfish and controlling with his only solution, if you can't handle it, quit your job, I'll take care of everything. I was pressured to have another child as it was made clear that my husband wanted a son, a namesake. With pregnancy complications and the best medical care, I became pregnant two and a half years after the birth of our daughter. I began to understand that I was dealing with someone with a narcissistic personality disorder as I began to capitulate to his demands while trying desperately to maintain my career, family, and friendships. I was losing myself ever so slowly on the inside over several years that many close to me didn't even realize it except by my distance. I had some renewed hope when I gave birth to our son James, a junior. However, that hope was again dismissed when my husband's infidelity with his newly hired nurse. My concern over his inappropriate relationship was always met with accusations of me being mentally unstable and unable to manage our children in my career. I began to believe that I was incapable and unfit for the wonderful life my husband was providing and unable to appreciate his hard work. I was constantly reminded of the consequences if I didn't comply with his requests and chosen lifestyle. I was told he would make sure he got full custody of our children and hire a nanny to care for them. When I was served with divorce papers, our children were one in three years of age. At that time, I was relieved. I thought this was a way of justifying the end of a marriage and an end to my unhealthy relationship. But what I didn't understand then was how the process of divorce would escalate the abuse and it would continue through the court system for the next 20 years. When I realized his terms would leave me with no control or assets for our children, I hired an attorney. This is when the violence escalated. The abuse became threatening and daily, daily life unbearable. I was cut off access to all funds as he threatened to prove me an unfit mother with photos of our daughter when she climbed in the dog's, dog's cage, a cut on her forehead when she fell on the coffee table, a burn on the tip of our son's finger when he touched the grill, he even obtained my medical records, which revealed I began to take antidepressants and attend counseling. After I called the Amherst police one morning, after being thrown to the ground in our garage, I became fearful of the firearms that my husband had in our home. My high-priced attorney was no help in trying to get my husband removed from our home. So I was desperate. I went to family tour court to obtain a restraining order. That was in 1999. Thinking about that experience today disturbs me. My shame and embarrassment hit a whole new level that day. I could tell by looking around the room that I wasn't the only one. Everyone else there was at a new low as well. It was the only the staff that worked at each of the multiple windows that didn't seem to realize this. At one window, when I was fishing for an empathetic ear, I said to one of the staff, I hope I don't see anyone I know. This is so embarrassing. Who is the judge and the law clerk I will see? She responded with their names and said to me, don't worry, you're gonna be fine. You're young and pretty. Oh, how I wish that could get me through what lay ahead. Thankfully, after a day of uncertainty at the court, I was able to obtain the order of protection that included having the firearms removed from our home. This is when I was able to begin to piece my life together. When we finally had a legal agreement, I thought my children's future would be secure. I was naive at the time to think that my ex-husband would follow the order, the agreement, but instead he used it to continue to control me. Enforcements of its details and defending my children was draining both emotionally and financially. It was only last year at this same exact time when my son was graduating high school on the eve of his graduation party that I received a court subpoena that he was attempting to emancipate him on his 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. 
Although all the court appearances <clears throat> resulted in my favor, the courts did nothing to address his actions of legal abuse. Leaving abusers without consequences and victims with few options. The ability to obtain the restraining order in the sanctity of the Family Justice Center for the past 10 years is a blessing that should not be undervalued. One person actually orchestrated this ability and has affected so many lives that have walked through those purple doors. We all have a responsibility to keep these services in place and expand them to where they are needed. My story has a happy ending and it led me here to Grand Island. As a new resident, I learned that the island is known for being the second largest freshwater island in the country, but sadly it's also known for having the highest rate of reported domestic violence in Oliveira County. I'm really proud to be a part of this effort along with many amazing people in this audience working to ensure that we get some purple doors here on Grand Island that lead to liberation without the shame. It's really much needed in Grand Island and I hope that all of you will help to try to support this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. We think we have space. We're working with Kelly Petrie and some folks at her church. That's Trinity United Methodist. Please come to the left. Um, so we've, we've looked at some space, and now we have some committees under the auspices of the board directors to try to figure out if this is something that the church wants to do. If not, we'll, we'll find a space. So we just wanted to plant that seed. We think we do. We should know, Cal. When do you think? We have some meetings uh, June 1st. Okay. Um, and if some of the logistical concerns and safety concerns can be met, then there may be a vote following shortly after. So maybe by mid-July or so, Hopefully we'll know. we'll know one way or the other. And if not, we'll find a space. We received some fantastic news about a month ago. Tiffany Semantic. Tiffany, do you want to stand up and wave? Tiffany is our development director. Next to her is Elena Jello. Ellen is our development coordinator. They drafted a grant to the New York State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence. There's a fellowship grant available. And they wrote what was going on in the application here in Grand Island and received a $75,000 grant, we did, for two years, $75,000 over two years, to hire an advocate to get this Family Justice Center satellite up and running in the first year and then pay for the advocate to run it the second year. Key Bank, we have Karen Sargent sitting here with her sister. <laughs> Reverend Myrna? Carla. Carla, Reverend Carla, who also has secured some money for our Family Justice Center Satellite Initiative, $5,000 a year over three years. Did I get that right? Yes. So we're already up and running on this project. Like we did in Orchard Park and in Williamsville, Amherst, North Towns, we'd like to raise about $100,000 over the course of a couple of years. We have many churches who actually signed on the dotted line to provide money, uh, five year, four, five, six year, whatever kind of agreement and commitment they felt comfortable making. So many, I, in the beginning our board was worried, okay, I've got all these churches, are I gonna try to convert people? I said, it's the exact opposite. They're not trained, they wanna know that when somebody comes to them, they can hand them a beautiful Family Justice Center pamphlet, or put a palm card in their hand, or take them by the palm of the hand to the satellite and say, you're in good hands. Mm -hmm. And we have seen that. We're the United Nations of churches, <laughs> including we have a temple, we have rabbis, you name the congregation, we got it. So we're gonna open up to questions, but first, Nathan, did you wanna have a word? Sure, I just, uh, quickly, well, first of all, thanks for everyone to coming out and speak today, and thank you, Reverend Earl, um, for your efforts, and thank you to Kelly, and Kelly, all you've done to push this forward. I know you've been a great leader on this. As a supervisor, I've learned that a community is like a basket. When I was a kid, I went to summer camp, and I remember making this terribly ugly basket. And I had this really patient instructor who told me, no, you gotta fix the basket here, redo it. And by the end of the summer camp, I had a really beautiful, nice basket. I think we need to look at our community like that a little bit. There's gaps we have. We have a very lovely, wonderful community, but we have to fill those gaps. And this is a huge gap. Mary said it's difficult to talk about. Even hearing the story, it's difficult. It's difficult to breathe. The burden of the story, you can feel 
the lack of autonomy, the lack of freedom people had. And when I visited the center in Buffalo, it was an overwhelming experience. Uh, I remember seeing some of the toys that were there and uh, thinking that they're the same toys my kids use and to think the little boys and little girls who come in are a part of this trauma um, and what they go through. So what I would like to ask from you is to help me build that basket, stronger community, and to do that, we can do it together. The town invests in things we believe in that make the basket stronger. We invest in the fire department, we invest in our schools, we use tax money to invest in things we believe in. Now, if that's possible, I think it's something we can explore and possibly invest in the way KeyBank has done and the way others have done to find a way to make this happen because this is a big need for our community. It's something we should be frankly ashamed of that we have such a high rate of domestic violence. Doesn't mean we're a terrible place, we're a wonderful place, but we have to fill that gap. We need to address that need. So what I wanna ask you is to help me help our town get involved in this. So we have the list, we've signed up on the list. We also wanna reach out to the council members who are not here, the other leaders in the town who are not here, to find a way to get this funded through additional private funds and hopefully even public funds. So that's my ask for you today. Please reach out. You can go to the town website, see the emails, say you came to this, say you thought it was important, say you felt moved by it, and help me fill that gap and build that basket. Because together, we can be more than a basket. We can be a polymer. We can be Kevlar. <laughs> so help me do that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So Tiffany and Ellen will have a sign-up sheet on the other side of the door with your email address. Our next step will be to plan a team meeting so that we can update you where we are on the location and talk about a fundraiser. Laura is going to orchestrate a huge fundraiser here on the island sometime this summer, maybe right here at the Launch Club. Maybe next summer, but we're working on it. Okay. <laughs> and what we will do is bring some of the founding mothers and fathers of the Williamsville and Orchard Park satellite to that meeting so that they can tell you how they did it and give you the inspiration. We're gonna open it up right now to any questions relevant to the initiative. Yeah. I have a question because we do already have an advocate in the Family Justice Center on Grand Island. Will this be in conjunction working with him? Well? You have a Family Justice Center on? No, 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 I'm sorry. She's talking about Joe. Oh, she's talking about Joe. Oh, oh Joe Chidoba. Yeah, he would be welcome to partner with us. Absolutely. Well, yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. He was invited to the meeting tonight. Is Joe here? No? Okay. He's with the Erie County Sheriff's Department. Yep. They are one of the six non-residential domestic violence service providers in Erie County. Family Justice Center, Crisis Services, Haven House, the Erie County Sheriff's Department, the District Attorney's Office, and uh, Hispanics United of Buffalo. Yes, Barbara. Can you hear that back there? When we open. <laughs> I would, uh, you're going to need volunteers. How does that work? And well, what kind of volunteers we, are you looking for? Right. As we get to the team meeting, we have a volunteer pamphlet that spells out all the things that volunteers can do. And this is how we recruited the volunteers who help us run Orchard Park, who help us run Williamsville. Many were on that team that founded the satellites. Anybody now in this room who wants to be part of the team will require you to start with a tour of the downtown Family Justice Center satellite. And if you come in in a little van on a weekend or weekend, a weeknight, depending on when you come, we can take a little road trip to both satellites as well. So that's where everybody starts with a tour of the downtown Family Justice Center satellite. So every team member will be required to do that before they come in here. And then they can get a sense of what kind of volunteer positions we have. We have a lot of training that they have to go through. They go tons of training. Just before we even do the screening process, six solid hours. Domestic Violence 101, we have cultural and legal entities or legal seminars that they go to. Two hours each for three different seminars. And then there we screen and then there's background checks and background investigations. Everybody goes through a series of pretty serious background 
checks before they can and we we screen too because so many people one in four one in three right one in nine people want to help they're out but they're still dealing with the trauma yet they want to save the world and they're not ready yet to be in front of anybody who's who's traumatized that would be a disaster for them and a disaster for the client so we do very thorough screening prior to bringing anybody on it's a process and then once they make it through that then they shadow and they do on-site training downtown before they would even set foot in one of the satellite offices. We have what, about how many active volunteers? Um, in 2000 downtown, we're about 50. Um, and our, with our ambassadors, we use about 50. Uh, 50 active volunteers. Active. We partner very closely with University of Buffalo School of Social Work. We now have the master's degree in social work students co-located with us for an entire year. It's some of the most spectacular free waiver you will ever get. And of course, the law school, fantastic partner. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Lots of training. And it's so important for people, watch that video. Sometimes we have people applying for jobs. And I say, before you come in, you watch that video. It's powerful, it's moving. Our forensic medical nurses tell us, don't sugarcoat it. So often they'll just self-eliminate after they watch the video. I had, it was triggered and I, I'm not ready to do this yet. That's why we recommend watching the video. Plus you get to see how gorgeous. We got kicked out of, I mean relocated, from the main Seneca <laughs> building to the main court building. Our 14th floor, beautiful center, is now being transformed into million dollar condos. Mm. Paul Kopmeyer bought the main court building, the main Seneca building, which we were, and the Rand building from David Sweet, the attorney who owned them for 70 years, and came in one day and said, I need to kick you, I mean relocate you. And we were looking for free space, we couldn't afford to move, we had already talked down Mr. Sweet to a really sweet uh, lease agreement. We're paying, I think, $18 a square foot, it's $23, class A office space. So. Um, Priam Enterprise, Paul Kolkmeyer, former CFO of First Niagara Bank, Lockport Savings Bank, bought him. And he was just great. He would come in and he understood the mission. He said to me one time, you know, every time I come in here to see you, I have to walk through the waiting room with our clients. He said, one of these days, I'm going to run into somebody I know, and I don't know who's going to be more embarrassed, me or them. So as I look for space for you, I'm going to keep that in mind. Sorry, we can't move. We can't afford to move. Sorry, we're not getting kicked out. Sorry, this is perfect. The views, our clients love the views. Paul, these are million dollar views of the waterfront. Finally, he brought us over to our new location, main court, and he said, this is perfect. You can put your center on this side. In the middle is this beautiful, what, three-story atrium, and you can put the center over there. So you can separate the center from the administration. When guests come, you can just get them into your room, and there's no conflict of interest. There's nobody to be embarrassed, or confidentiality will be preserved. And I'm thinking, it's gorgeous, it's perfect. Pa, oh, we can't afford to move. I'll pay for the move. 12,800 square feet, it's going to take a couple of days. I'll pay for it. Well, we can't afford a build out. There are 19 offices over there on that side where you want to put us. My men will do the build out at cost, chase it to private foundations. You don't have to pay me. I don't care how long it takes to get it. When you get it, pay me. We can't afford an architect. I mean, we, we, we said, I have an architect. You dream it. Beth Biscaglia, she's on retainer. She'll design it. Finally, I said, all right, well, I can't afford it. I'm looking for free space. He said, give me a break. I can't give you free space. You're paying $18. Everybody here is paying a minimum of $23 a square foot. Give me some kind of number. I can't give it to you for free. And we were right around the corner from the court. Literally, you can do a split and have one leg in the Family Justice Center and one leg in the court. And we just gotten a grant from the state for a court advocate. You need to be in walking distance. That was the other perfect thing. He said, all right, $18 a square foot, that's a good price. What can you afford? Give me a number. I said, $3. <laughs> he drew up the contract the next day. It's a 10-year lease, and it goes up 25 cents in 10 years. I told him I was willing to pay double what we pay for each satellite, but he didn't go for that. <laughs> yes. It would be hard to know that because based on just over time that 
How many people are all helped? Yeah. Well, we keep data. Tiffany Semanic has all the data because the grants that we get from the state require quarterly reporting. So we keep an absolute ton of data. So yes, we can tell you numbers, we can tell you ages, you name it, we can tell it, yeah. We track it. Did, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I'm wondering how many people have been helped that, that came to you on a grand island? Do you have to Oh, we, we don't have a family justice, we do not have a family justice center on, on oh, Grand no, Island. I understand that, but, but people from Grand Island. Oh, we could probably look at the stats to see how many Grand Island residents. And I know when the team came to me, they said the problem with living on Grand Island is the same problem we were having with people living in the South Towns and the North Towns. They don't want to leave the island. <laughs> and they made that painfully clear to me when they came, but I got it. I totally understand it. You got a wind tunnel on this island? <laughs> and a couple of bridges to get off. I understand that totally. Yeah. So we will track the numbers. And that, again, that was one of the main reasons this little small team came to the Family Justice Center to say they're not going to come downtown. They're not even going to go to Williamsville to get help. They want it on the island. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, what are the statistics uh, of, of the domestic violence on Grand Island? Like, what is the, the statistics in terms of the police calls? Mm -hmm. The Sheriff's Department would have that. And the New York State Police, I believe, respond here sometimes as well. And, that's, and, and they, do, they do the comparison to say that we have the highest rate of domestic violence? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That comparison comes from um, the reporting that goes into CPS and Central Police Services. Every right. town is required to report their number of domestic violence. Um, and then they base it off of that. And I do want to say that that's based on per capita. So Grand Island is per capita. Clarence has a high rate too. And the DCJS is the Department of Criminal Justice Services on the state level. Yeah. But I think the most important statistic to zero in on that one in three, that one in four, that one in seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was in uh, Williamsville East this morning, did all the juniors and seniors, boys and girls. I was there for three hours. How did schools know to reach out to departments? Word of mouth. We, I probably go to, well, Tiff, you uh, track those numbers. How many schools a year? And Tiffany will go if I can't. That's, it's so important to do it, and it's hard for me. I'm a 60-year-old white woman from the <laughs> suburbs. What am I doing in the middle of the east side of Buffalo? And I can tell you, you can drop a pin on the carpet when we talk, they are so respectful. And was it the social worker, one of the administrators at the, uh, the East High School told me the other day, 100% of these kids come from violence. 100% of these kids come from violence. But the same thing when I, I'm called to Akron or Eden or Williamsville East or Orchard Park or West Seneca, they're telling me what they're seeing in the hallways. You've done school in Grand Island. Uh, let's see, have I, seen, yeah, I have, I've been on Isla, uh, Grand Island a few times or at the schools over the course of a few years. And the principal of the, was she the superintendent? She's reached out to me a couple times too. Yeah, and she's, uh, um, I think she is either the superintendent or the principal. Again, I speak every day, yeah. sometimes four or five times a day, so I lose track of who's who. But they've been, Grand Island has been great. I've probably spoken in the last eight years here on Grand Island. I could count because I keep my planners. I bet. 15, 18 times. Mr. and Mrs. Cook, Lois and Bill Cook are back there, dear friends of my family. How many times have you been? <laughs> they live on Grand Island. How many times have you come to see me speak on Grand Island? The Rotary, there's several women's groups. Zanta, even active Zanta, professional women's group. Yeah. Um, Earl has had me in churches and with the pastors group. You've been at Trinity, you've been at St. Martin's. Yes, at St. Stephen's. I bet maybe I've spoken 25 times here over the years. But in, in the school though, have you been in the school? I have been in Grand Island High School a few times and did a little seminar in the library one time as well. But I'm happy to go back. I haven't been there in a while. 
that program to speak to the children? Uh -huh. to well, oh my goodness. Well, we speak to the kids, but I constantly am going into schools to speak to administrators, social workers, teachers, BOCES. So we have a lot of days where the kids are off. I'll go in at eight o'clock in the morning and spend a couple hours. Or Tiffany, if, if you covered for me a couple times when we do that, oh yeah, we do that quite a bit. And that's where the word of mouth comes in. It's just the two of you that do all of that? Mm -hmm. Right. And in, in addition to running three satellites, I mean two satellites mm -hmm. in a downtown, we're very streamlined. We have 10 employees, four domestic violence advocates, Tiffany, Ellen, Ellen's part-time, myself, two forensic medical unit nurses who job share, and an intake coordinator. Ten people. I run it like I would have run town government had those other town board members let me. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan, I would have loved to have been on the town board with you two. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. I think it's good to hear Nate committed to trying to get public funds for this because it's wonderful to have the volunteer effort and to do fundraising, but something a community needs to provide and just as important as providing the computers. It would be phenomenal. Get a little budget line going. Yeah. All right, uh, we're going to stick around, Tiffany and Ellen, and um, I will be, in, we'll be here. So if you have any other questions, and uh, we will shoot you an email when we decide the best possible time to have our first organizational team meeting. And again, I will get a couple people from each satellite founding team members to come so you can bounce things off them. And we can, you can do it any way you want here. You don't have to do either one of the models that they chose to, to use. It just kind of got its own rhythm. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.